Good evening, welcome, and thank you for joining us for a conversation on the soon to be published anthology, A Field Guide to White Supremacy, such a timely topic. Um, my name is Tracy Matthews. I'm the executive director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago. Before I introduce our guest speakers tonight, I'd like to thank the co-presenters of this book event, the Seminary Co-op Bookstores and the Department of History at the University of Chicago. And in particular, I'd like to thank Caitlin Cassidy and the rest of the staff at Seminary Co-op who organized the logistics and tech and uh, Race Center staff members, Tierra Kilpatrick, Beth Awano and Angel Torres Guevara who managed publicity for tonight's event. Now on to our speakers. First, we'll hear from Kathleen Ballou, who's an assistant professor of US history and the college and a faculty affiliate of the Center for the Study of Race and Culture, the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and the Democracy Initiative at the University of Chicago. Her award-winning teaching centers on the broad themes of history of the present, conservatism, race, gender, violence, identity, and the meaning of war. Kathleen's first book, Bring the War Home, The White Power Movement in Paramilitary America, uses previously classified FBI documents and vivid personal testimonies to explore how white power activists created a vast and influential social movement through a shared post-Vietnam story about betrayal by the government. In addition to her scholarly publications, Kathleen has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN.com, The Daily Beast, and Descent. And she and her research have been featured in outlets such as Esquire, Time, the Chicago Tribune, MSNBC, and NPR. Kathleen is the co-editor, co-editor, excuse me, Ramon Gutierrez of A Field Guide to White Supremacy, which features several pieces of her writing, including the chapter, There Are No Lone Wolves, The Power Movement at War. And the book is scheduled to be available to purchase on October 26th. Kathleen will be joined in conversation by Roderick A. Ferguson, who is the William Robertson Co. Professor of Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Yale University. He is the author of One Dimensional Queer, We Demand the University and Student Protests, The Reorder of Things, the University and its Pedagogies of Minority Difference, and Aberrations in Black Toward a Queer of Color Critique. He's the co-editor with Grace Hong of the anthology Strange Affinities, The Gender and Sexual Politics of Comparative Racialization. He's also co-editor with Erica Edwards and Jeffrey Ogbar of Keywords of African American Studies. And he was the 2020 recipient of the Kessler Award from the Center for LGBTQ Studies at the City University of New York Graduate Center. For a field guide to white supremacy, Roderick contributed the chapter, Homophobia and American Nationalism, Mass Murder at the Pulse Nightclub. The format for tonight will include comments from both order, authors, excuse me, and a conversation between them to be followed by a Q&A with the audience. Please feel free to put any questions in the Q&A box. The chat is also active. And now I will pass the mic over to Kathleen Ballou. Thank you so much, Tracy. And um, I, I just want to extend our thanks to you for organizing and for introducing and um, handling the Q&A today um, and for the Center of uh, Race, Politics and Culture support of the volume. Um, and if you'll all forgive me, I just want to quickly thank the people that contributed money to the conference that um, began this anthology and along the way. So um, the Lawrence Grauman Fund at California Press, um, the CSRPC, the Frank Institute for the Humanities International House was so gracious to let us um, host the conference there, the Global Studies Mobility Project, the Department of History, the Social Sciences Division, um, and the Chauncey and uh, Marion Deary McCormick Foundation all contributed to this project. And thanks too, to the Seminary Co-op for hosting us tonight. Um, and before I speak, I just want to also say we are um, all here without my wonderful co-editor and esteemed colleague Ramon Gutierrez, who is ill and could not join us. Um, so if everyone could just send some healing vibes towards him, I would personally appreciate it. And hopefully he will be joining us in some of these conversations about the volume sooner than later. This all started 
um, from his impetus um, in wanting to think about how to bring together conversations about um, studying anti-immigration and the history of legal exclusion with the study of white supremacy more broadly. Um, and that led us to a conference that brought a lot of these pieces of writing um, to fruition early in the process. And then we went and commissioned a whole bunch more, including um, Rod's excellent essay on the Pulse nightclub shooting that had appeared um, previously. And remind me, where was it, Rod? I think it was in um, GLQ. Yeah. Um, GLQ. Thank you. Yes, we were we were looking for something specifically about that, and um, we were so delighted to find your piece. Um, so the the this this book came from both Ramon and I feeling that even within the academy, when we study the various sites where we experience white power, white extremism, white supremacy the history of legal exclusion, the history of systemic racism, the history of individual racist ideology, um, these are often located in different fields of the academy. There are good reasons for this. Um, but for instance, there aren't that many times when someone who studies the white power movement as I do is in conversation with say, the folks in the law school about the history of racial exclusion, the folks in ethnic studies programs about impacted communities when we're talking about anti-immigrant violence, et cetera. So this began with an academic impetus to bring together these different conversations um, around what we might learn from each other. Very, very quickly, it turned into a broader conversation because we realized that for journalists, for activist communities, and for general readers, um, there was a lot of definitional work needed around many of these topics. Um, so uh, this is not unlike the keywords series for kind of a, a different audience. And I'd love to talk more with you, Rod, about, about that project. But um, at some point doing interviews for Bring the War Home, I ended up just picking up the Associated Press style book um, which is still sort of the main piece of information that you can find in person at a newsroom when you're thinking about whether to capitalize a word, which terminology ought to be used for what, um, and sort of a, a basic manual of operations for journalistic coverage. And I was very startled to find that the 2019 edition had long entries on ISIS, on Al-Qaeda, even on the Irish Republican Army, which has not lately been in our headlines, at least in the United States. Um, and hardly anything on the militant right and the white power movement. Um, what it did have was outdated, um, mostly about the alt-right and Charlottesville. Didn't have things about the Klan, about militia movements, about skinhead organizing, much less the current day formations like Boogaloo, Three Percenters, Oath Keepers, et cetera. And I found that a lot of what I was doing in interviews was um, sort of laying out the land for journalists who were almost always new to thinking about these stories, and then trying to connect them with appropriate experts to ask more specialized questions. So the field guide does both of those things. Um, we open with a set of considerations for the AP style book. Um, I would not go so far as to call these recommendations because I have never um, managed a newsroom and there's a whole process over there for how they think about language. But there are also things that historians um, sort of think of as best practices that are informed by our area of study. And this is true for legal scholars and others who consulted with us on that section. So for instance, when there is a new uh, sort of arriving group of immigrants, um, there are deep historical reasons not to use language like flood or tide or wave, um, and not to use language like hoard or other sorts of animalistic um, imagery, because these sorts of ling linguistic decisions have been used to demonize uh, arriving immigrant groups, uh, I mean, at least back to the 1890s, if not, um, for a much longer period of time. So the, the beginning section of the field guide is really just about language and terms. Um, these are not easy decisions, and one of the ones we really struggled with is, um, as different news outlets have decided to capitalize the word black, what do we do about capitalizing the word white? Um, we ended up feeling that we ought not to, but I think this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, so there's stuff in there for journalists. And then um, the, the field guide is divided into four sections thinking about how white supremacy has worked and does work now. And this may be a good time for me to just lay out how we're using that term in this volume. Um, 
and I'm working out this metaphor, um, on some, sometimes on Twitter and sometimes with people. So you tell me if it doesn't work. Um, I think what we have here is an idea of white supremacy is like a fence. And there are many different planks in this fence. Sometimes they touch, sometimes they don't. Um, so if my first book uh, about white power violence is one plank in the fence, um, there are many other planks in this fence, like um, disparities of medical outcomes based on race, like the law that uh, makes it easier to convict people of color, like incarceration and policing practices, like um, racial capitalism and accumulation of wealth. We could go on and on. And for general readers, part of what we're trying to show here is that it's not enough to just not continue to build the fence because here this fence is, and we, um, if we would like to have a more democratic society, we have to figure out how to move past it. But it's also not enough to just deal with racial violence because there's still the whole rest of the fence that we have to think about. Um, and there are people with overtly white supremacist ideology um, nativist and national policy making decisions that are reinforcing this fence all the time. So the guidebook is really meant to lay out that entire set of problems. Um, and it does so in, in, an, in an anthology, of course, where these chapters are standing as separate pieces, but that we really think that by seeing the whole of this thing, we might be able to approach this problem or at least contribute to that conversation. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that the outcome we're hoping for here is that by putting these stories together, we might be able to um, locate different kinds of coalition building and different kinds of possibilities for action that might otherwise have been invisible. Um, so for instance, going back to white power violence and the organized white supremacist violence that I study, we often consume stories about white power shootings as um, you know, anti-Latinx violence in El Paso, anti-Black violence in Charleston, anti-Semitic violence in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life synagogue shooting, anti-Islamic violence in Christchurch. But all of those actions were carried out by gunmen who share an ideological, um, an ideological frame, who share a, a social movement backing up what they're doing, um, even who use the same images and languages um, in their manifestos. And when we understand these events as interconnected instead of standing as the work of quote unquote lone wolves, all of a sudden these impacted communities have something in common because they're facing the same problem. And those impacted communities don't have the same levels of um, public validation, of resources, of media attention, um, and connecting them might make something possible. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. I'm happy to spend most of our time today in conversation and with your questions, and I will turn it over to Rod. Thank you very much for joining us, too. Um, Rod, I, I really love the piece in this book, and I'm so happy to hear from you about it. Okay, well, yeah, um, the, you know, piece, you know, really came about, um, you know, out of a kind of curiosity that I had, you know, in terms of the media and political responses to the 2016 shooting. You know, so f f just to jog people's memories, um, Omar Mateen, who uh, was uh, an Afghan-American born and raised within the US, uh, went to the Pulse nightclub and shot uh, and killed uh, 49 people and injured 53 people. Now, the discourse that came out of that, you know, from the then politicians at the time, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Donald Trump, they all framed him, you know, in terms of, you know, one, as if he were not, you know, an American, and as if homophobia was an exceptional thing to the U.S. and could be explained, you know, in terms of his... Uh, foreign origins, right? That was curious to me because it was a way of forgetting just the everydayness of homophobic violence. Um, one that, and you think here about, you know, this was not the first uh, shooting at a gay nightclub. And oftentimes those shootings, you know, were carried out by um, American citizens who were white, right? Um, and so I, that was a real curiosity for me. Like, why make homophobia into this uh, import, you know, from other parts of the world, particularly 
uh, you know, the Muslim world. You know, so that was one. The other thing that I wanted to do is actually to address the everydayness of violence, you know, within U.S. society, particularly homophobic violence within U.S. society. It doesn't even have to take, you know, a sort of uh, spectacular outcome as a mass murder. You know, it could be bullying in schools, you know, it could be, you know, harassment in the workplace, you know, it could be any number of things, you know, um, homophobia, transphobia, when we're talking about sports, right? But there's an everydayness, you know, to homophobic violence, and that violence takes many different expressions, right? The other thing I wanted to do is to connect it to um, precisely what you and Ramon do uh, in the framing of the book and connect it to white supremacy, right? that uh, the reason that you can turn homophobia into um, you know, a foreign import is you know, through a logic that says that you know, the US is uh, on, always on the side of right, you know, where um, queerness, homosexuality, LGBTQ stuff is concerned. And that uh, the Islamic world is constructed then as a monolithically homophobic and patriarchal, you know, site. Um, now, all of those come out of, you know, whether we call it a kind of uh, Orientalism, um, you know, and Islamophobia, you know, they're kind of siblings too. Uh, white supremacy, you know, if you're thinking about white supremacy on a global scale at that point. Um, and so that was the impetus for the piece, you know, to say that there's nothing exceptional about uh, homophobic violence or Islamophobia, you know, in the US. And also that we are in a very dangerous moment globally where um, the production of an other, you know, becomes part of uh, national politics, not only in this country, but in other countries, especially ones that are experiencing, like this country, um, a kind of authoritarian, um, discourse you know so yeah maybe i'll leave it at that and we can start our conversation thank you i think that also um something that stood out to me in your comments um is something i've been thinking about a lot in regards to white supremacy and in regards to kind of social phenomena in general um so one question that I get a lot thinking about mass shootings is if we want to study the problem of gun violence, we shouldn't really study mass shootings, right? They're rare. A small number of people are impacted. Um, if we want to look at the problem of gun violence, um, surprise, surprise, it corresponds with neighborhoods that were once redlined with a number of other factors having to do with over-policing and under-resourcing um, and availability of guns. Um, but I think that there's something really interesting in the way that you're framing it that really gets at this question of what can a mass shooting tell us about gun violence as a broader social problem, right? Like what, in what ways does an act of mass violence mobilize, um, you know, homophobia, white supremacy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I suppose um, I'm, I'm, I'm clutching for what the right word is for the transnational component of what you're talking about, I suppose, Islamophobia, but it's also sort of like U.S. Imperial, imperial. Yeah, yeah, it's also, you know, um, you know, the militarized ethos and attitude that pervades this country. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, you would not have, um, you know, a kind of adoration of a gun, adoration of weapons. You know, even when you're talking about sort of local and domestic setting, if you did not already have a national history that um, fetishized militarization, you know? Yeah. Like they're actually really connected. Yes. 
And the, of course, the huge event that happened while this book was in production was the insurrection on January 6th, which mm-hmm. really brought a lot of these um, essays into even starker relief for us as we were editing the volume. Um, but I think also having a language for being able to explain. So I, I think of um, January 6th as sort of the, the um, collision of what we might think of as the Trump base um, which has, of course, varying degrees of radicalization and intensity, um, with QAnon, which is a new sort of mobilization of a very old set of conspiracy theories, mm-hmm. um, with the organized white power movement, which, mm-hmm. which um, to me is the most predictable and familiar of those three strands, because it's mm-hmm. the one that I've studied, it's the one that has a big uh, footprint and in infrastructure and in history, a big social network that we can look at and trace. Um, but those three things coming together really stretches, um, I think, the kinds of expertise that historians and, and academics can claim in some ways, because we're talking now about not only the underground violent revolutionary component of that movement, but also the way that our mainstream politics is making space for and um, yeah. condoning and failing Absolutely. to investigate and in some cases electing um, people Absolutely. who are in these groups. BuzzFeed just published something about, I think it was 48 um, elected officials are in the Oath Keepers, which is just stunning and not something that ever would have been possible during the time that I was studying in the 1980s. This is a Say huge- Say that again, it's happening to 48 again. It was something like 48 elected politicians are members of the Oath Keepers or have yeah, strong yeah. ties to the Oath Keepers. And yeah, in yeah, many cases yeah. talked about not decrying their yeah. um, affiliations with that group. I mean, so the mainstream inroads part, I think is part of, um, you know, it's something that I, I really didn't consider much in the research for my first book, just because it was, that door was so thoroughly shut and now it isn't. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you began talking about um, uh, all of these folks in different fields studying white supremacy, which used to be this really specialized niche yeah. topic, right? Yeah. And, you know, and how, Part of that is because just the sort of um, outright and public pervasiveness of white supremacy at this moment that no you know, scholar who studies US history or US social formations can ignore it, right? Well, the other piece of that is that, um, you know, we also have to turn our attention to the links between what appear to be a domestic occurrence and the sort of international iteration, you know, of those things, you know, that in the Omar Mateen case, you know, you've got um, a sort of national discourse about that stuff happens over here, over there, it does not happen here. You know, you've also got you know, an um, internationalist and geopolitical discourse about what goes on over there. You know, Islamophobia happens over there. Patriarchy happens over there, you know? And so these fears that we oftentimes think are separate, the national and the international come together in these really horrific ways. Yeah, I. Um, it, it strikes me something I saw going around on social media when, um, you know, after the fall of Afghanistan this summer, quote unquote, and after sort of the the renewed concerns about women's rights in Afghanistan, um, somebody was was circulating something at the same time about um, the incredibly restrictive anti-abortion law passed in Texas. Mm-hmm. And the, the yeah. fact that we don't have those in the same conversation is, is an interesting artifact yeah. in of yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. I also wonder about the, um, the the focus on how we tell the story about the event immediately afterward, I think, is a really interesting through line too. Because I think part of the the um, the most intense sort of set of deep seated denials, um, even by people who really want to confront white supremacy and want to confront what happened on January six, is that immediate turn to this is not who we are, mm-hmm. and that was repeated. So right. often that I think they did a New York Times Magazine special about um, stop saying that, um, right. mostly from historians and others who study racial formation. But right. you know, it's 
it's, it's, it's just a stunning claim um, that that's not who we are. And not just, not just sort of like in thinking about extremist violence, but in thinking about the way that vigilantism and mob violence with the claim of seizing sovereignty has been used over and over again through American mm -hmm, history, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or maybe even um, pre-colonial or, or pre-United uh, States colonial American history mm -hmm. to, to do exactly this. Um, so that's one of the things that we really wanted to try to figure out in the volume is to bring together those different lenses. And I think the, the gender section is another interesting place that we found we needed to articulate some of this because um, the way that sort of normative ideas of gender and violence against women, violence against LGBT folks, violence against trans folks, um, and non-gender conforming people has been used particularly to prop up these bigger systems of power, I think is part of the conversation too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, um, what people, um, both professional academic or, you know, sort of um, professional scholars and lay people um, are discovering is what many of us professional and lay folks have been saying for years that these things are connected. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. You know, they're not separate. We want to tell ourselves that, um, you know, this kind of stuff doesn't happen in this country or this is not who we are in our ideals of American as Americans. Um, that uh, fascism, authoritarianism, something that happens in you know, Germany, Japan, and Italy. It is not something that happens, you know, in the U.S. And, you know, we're in a moment where people are starting to see the connections and other folks are saying, writing op-eds now about, I didn't see it then and I wish I had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's interesting to watch sort of the things that we, that I know you and I have been teaching for mm -hmm. a while. You, I mean, like, I'm, I'm really, I guess I'm relatively new to this, but like, <laughs> but that folks have been teaching this for such a long time and oh, now yeah. it's like oh, yeah. reading yeah. out into the public moment, which is really interesting yeah. to see. Um, and to think about the, um, all of the different ways where, so like I, one question that I get a lot is about, um, I, I, I mean, it's rooted in the sort of American exceptionalism that I think many of us still learn in high school about the, the promise of the nation and the radical idea of life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. And um, I think a lot of the time people get that piece of the history without the part about um, that those radical promises were not intended for everyone mm -hmm. um, at the beginning and, and were really only for Mm -hmm. white, free, property-owning men. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. over time, through a lot of work and organizing and coalition building and um, standing and protesting Protesting. and a lot of backlash and reactionary violence, we broadly scraped together that category bigger and bigger and bigger yeah, yeah, over yeah. centuries. Yeah. Um, I And it's, it's always really um, interesting to me, this idea that... Um, that the United States is, uh, or I'm trying to think about how exactly to say this. It's like, I think the threatening thing about talking about white supremacy is that it somehow defrays the, the radical promises that many of us are very attached to. And I think it's actually, of course, you know, the United States is not unique in its legacy of racial violence and racial inequality. Many, many places have struggled with these problems, but I think we are somewhat unique in how little we have had a collective understanding of that shared history and how much um, we have sort of subsumed those discussions. And it strikes me that even something like Make America Great Again is a, it's a historical argument. Right, like that's a that that enlists people. Um, that includes a category of who is America, what is America, when is America, what greatness is, whether it can be restored or not, whether it should be. I mean, that's that's an argument. That's a historical argument we should have. Um, and I think that history is being mobilized um, in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. um, I might think of the Proud Boys wearing the Pinochet was right shirts, invoking dictatorship in the Southern Cone. Um, Dylan Roof, the Charleston gunman, um, wearing the Rhodesian flag, 
Um, as I mean, Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, didn't even exist in Dylan Roof's lifetime, but he's invoking that history as part of a yes, invoking a colonial history again. Yeah. There's the, the, yeah. the international again. Yeah, yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, you know, it's um, I lost my train of thought, but um, you know, I think like part of what well, here it is. Part of what you're getting at is, you know, one of the things that's very difficult for people to confront Americans, right? And it's something that I only came to in 2016, that this is a deeply undereducated country. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, I mean, forget whether or not you have a degree or not. Everybody's undereducated, right? What people are educated in is if they have formal degrees, they're educated in their specialty, you know? But this is a deeply undereducated country. The great historian, John Hope Franklin, before he died, African-American historian said, it's a country that knows myths. It does not know history, right? Yeah. At that moment, you've got an undereducated populace, right? That, you know, um, cannot make the kind of connections that uh, the volume is insisting, you know? Um, you know, cannot see and cannot abide contradictions when they notice them, you know? It's a deeply, deeply undereducated country and uh, white supremacy needs that undereducation in order for it to live, it does. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it, um, so where does that, where should that education happen? If we could, if we could recommend things, wh where should that education be repaired? Is that- It should happen in our schools, but you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know I mean, but like you have like, um, uh, you know, now mobilization against critical race theory as if uh, it's in K through 12. Yeah. You know, as if Patricia Williams is in K through 12, as if Kim Crenshaw is taught in K through 12, yeah. as if Richard Delgado is taught in K through 12. 12, Neil Gotan, all of these are legal scholars, all right? You know, as if what kids are getting from kindergarten to 12th grade is uh, a study in race and jurisprudence. It's absurd. Yeah. And yet people are mobilizing around it, you know? So it's a country that's very invested in preserving certain ideologies and keeping people undereducated. Yeah. I think also, not for nothing, um, the fact that we don't have civics in many high school uh, classrooms anymore, um, the fact that people don't understand the basic functioning of the democratic system, even as it's supposed to work, never mind whether it does work, um, is another component here as well. <clears throat> there was a um, a couple of years ago, the county where I went to high school uh, in Colorado, Jefferson County, Colorado, which is in the suburbs, um, had a push from a sort of coalition of ultra-right school board members to replace the AP U.S. history curriculum with um, one that was more patriotic um, and did not promote civil disobedience was the, the package. Um, and an interesting thing happened where uh, all the high schoolers got really mad and walked out. This is a, this is a, um, a very, very white school district mm -hmm. where, um, you know, it, uh, Colorado is a purple state, of course, um, purple leaning blue, but in this district um, has, has some democratic politics, but it is not a radical place. Like this is not Boulder or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and these kids, like it was much more than just the AP US history students. It was a whole bunch of other people who were um, feeling very protective of their right to learn history. And it was interesting how deeply um, this issue sort of went all of a sudden. And they ended up organizing to get the school board thrown out and um, to okay. get other people elected. And it was a, a really interesting thing to watch. And it makes me think that like, you know, uh, as, um, as work by, um, you know, Natalia Melman Petrozella and Elizabeth Gillespie McRae and others has shown these, these school board battles have been a site of organized um, sort of white supremacist and ultra-right curriculum planning 
um, and local political drives for at least, I mean, at least since Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, I mean, that that resistance to it is interesting too. And I'm, I'm, I was happy to see that. But that was pre-critical race theory kerfuffle. So I mean, we'll we'll see how this shakes out in local school boards as well. Yeah, I mean, I think what you know. I mean, I think we're going to see resistances like that, you know, yeah. from young people, especially because, you know, I mean, one of the benefits of um, social media, though there are ills to it, um, is that, you know, folks are getting word about, you know, this text, that writer, you know, from venues outside of the classroom. And so oftentimes you'll have um, students who have been reading outside of the, the received curriculum. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, which is an interesting one too. And I think um, I would really love to speak to some people who work in, um, who, who's, who do media studies and communication studies, because I'm, I'm fascinated with how they're finding those texts. Yeah, um, yeah. I agree. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I had like, you know, a couple of high school students contact me out of the blue because they read One Dimensional Queer, my last book, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. how did you get this book? And like, you know, and it's not being taught in, in a class, but, you know. No, but they're, they're going around, like they go around. I mean, um, I, 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 I assume that a lot of this is in places that I don't understand at all, like TikTok and, and, you know, other social media mm -hmm whatever the next thing is after TikTok that I haven't even heard of yet. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I had an amazing moment where um, my my niece who is in high school, um, her teacher was talking about um, my book and she called me and she was like, they talked about your book. And I was like, <laughs> this is like a new level of something because like, I don't know, that's just like, like out there in the worldness. Yeah, like, no, it's true. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, my 12th grade nephew decided he had to, an assignment in his progressive school uh, in Georgia to, everybody had to write about a famous LGBTQ person. And his mother sent me a text saying, he decided he's going to write about you. <laughs> that's so cool. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's really fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think we have a lot of questions coming in. So um, I'm happy to move to those. Um, I think Tracy is going to come in and, and help us moderate. I am. I'm going to jump in. This has been really great so far. Um, so we have a bunch of questions. So maybe I'll read a couple, two or three at a time, and then you all can kind of jump in um, where you want. So I'm going to start with the very first person who's thanking you all so much for the work and is asking um, whether in these recommendations for language, for, such as those for journalists, is there a discussion of how white supremacy as it is perpetuated in different contexts? Have we, we have words like dogless, whistling, race baiting, which suggests, suggests Southern strategy. Um, and then we have uh, white supremacist dogma in mainstream media contexts like conservative news, which is contrast, contrasted with Westernist movements like Proud Boys, great replacement theorists. Like, how do we discuss all these, like, how do we make sense of it and help people to understand um, the various strains? And then relatedly, another question, what do you think about the platforming and normalizing of white supremacist leaning voices, messaging in mainstream media and pop culture? I'm, I'm happy to address that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to yield to you. Yeah. The, um, so one trick in the format of a style guide is that we can't list out every one of the things that you have just mentioned, even though all of those would, you know, happily create a, a, a full entry in a style guide about the ways that they are historical terms, the way that they're loaded, the way that they're um, problematic, right? Um, but what we did try to do is, okay, so I, and I would separate sort of the historically loaded terms from the things that are in current usage. As the style book is trying to deal with both of those problems, I think. Um, so one thing that I uh, learned from my archival research is that people have spent an enormous amount of energy over time trying to nail down the specifics of the white power groups. Um, so in the 1980s, there is 
a ton of journalistic and academic ink spilled over, okay, exactly which slogan goes with the neo-Nazi group, which one with the Klan group, which people are in which group, exactly how big is this faction or that faction, how much um, is it, you know, uh, where is the stronghold of each of these groups? When on the ground, that's just not how any of this worked because people had multiple memberships, people moved around between groups, groups shared information and images, slogans moved around between groups, images and tattoos moved around between groups, um, and they were nationally coordinated. Um, and at the end of the day, the takeaway for me was that we need to do much less of exactly which is which and much more of what is the groundswell. So the style guide recommendations are oriented in that direction. We give a brief listing of some of the groups that are um, in play right now, um, but with the huge caveat, which is um, supported by the, the work of sociologists like Cynthia Miller Idris, as well as the historical archive, that as soon as these groups are named and watched, um, they immediately switch their language, they switch their symbols. Um, so we're, we um, are interested to hear in a, in a flexible definition that can allow for how these groups operate. And I will say too that this is a um, a trend in the, the folks that work on this. Um, so for instance, the, the Biden administration's um, report on, um, I forget what this was called. Maybe it was called like domestic extremism report. It's the one that just came out from NSA. They similarly have sort of avoided saying like, this is the definition of the thing because what we need is something flexible and mobile that can track as these groups shift. They shift very, very fast. Um, Cynthia's work, um, which started in um, high schools in Germany, she noticed that um, students who were banned from wearing a t-shirt that um, so in white power organizing, 88 is code for Heil Hitler. It's just the eighth letter of the alphabet twice. So they banned shirts that said 88 in these high schools. And then the students immediately started wearing shirts that said 14 divided by two. Um, same thing, same signification. We have to be flexible enough to track as it evolves. Okay, and then on the other side, the historically loaded things, we did do some um, suggestions in the AP section that are about um, problematic terms. So for instance, we, we I think, did an entry for reverse racism, um, which is a sort of, one, one of these terms that is usually used to take focus away from actual structures of inequality um, and towards other, other problematic things. Um, so I think we put in something like use with caution and a little note about how this term is often used to distract from a real analysis of systemic inequality. Um, so we tried to do both of those kinds of recommendations in the guide. Great, thank you. Okay, another question came in saying, can you say more about how you think about the connection between violent white supremacist movements and everyday white supremacy? Um, and this person is specifically referencing uh, Trumpism going mainstream, but also the white liberals who might be opposed to mixed income housing and think that affirmative action disadvantages their children and so on. <laughs> That's a good one, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think, you know, we see so much of that, right? <laughs> Kathleen, you can start. Well, I was just, you know, this is where I'm trying to go with this fence thing, right? Like it's not enough to just not build the fence. The fence is there. So we have to do more than just say that I, myself and my family are not contributing to, like I'm not nailing boards onto the fence doesn't take down the fence. Um, so I, yeah, do you want to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that, um, you know, if you think back to uh, the 1960s, and I'm thinking particularly of the critiques that folks like uh, Lorraine Hansberry and James Baldwin made of white liberals or what used to be called Friends of the Negro, you know, so people who, um, you know, weren't like the Bull Connors necessarily, but do precisely what, you know, this colleague is uh, indicating in the question that folks who were very much invested in uh, their racial hierarchy, you know, 
you know, like I was listening to some radio show yesterday that said that, you know, like, um, you know, like white upper middle class, middle class Americans like diversity, but they don't like too much of it. So once you get above like a certain percentage, then, you know, the alarms start to fire off. So that's, you know, immediately about managing um, the racial difference around you so that it doesn't interfere with your own authority, you know, your hegemony or your property values, you know? <laughs> and then late, I mean, again, you know, it seems that one of the recurring themes in uh, the field guide is that there are links between explosive violence and also everyday violence. And that's an example of such a link. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna turn to another question in the chat. Um, and this one is for you, Kathleen, um, the term lone wolf. Can you say a little bit more about person is asking, is there another word that can be used to describe lone wolf shootings that shows their connections behind their motivations? Yes. Um, so I think in the style guide, we said lone wolf do not use. <laughs> like, I, I think full stop to that phrase. Um, I think um, I've been having really interesting discussions this week with some fantastic grad students about whether there are any individual and in apolitical acts of violence really once we start analyzing at this level. Um, but I think um, in terms of the white power movement, we could say individual actor or um, cell style actor or something of that kind is usually appropriate. But I think that the impetus for journalists is to figure out what the ideological frame of violence is, what the social connections are um, and what the aim of the violent action is um, there are cases when when there isn't a clear one um, and for instance I'm writing about the Columbine shooting right now I think that that is not a case of white power violence um, in the same way although certainly there are, are there are all kinds of different degrees of white supremacy at play in that story um, I think that journalists should just stop using lone wolf as a phrase I think that would fix almost all, all of it in one fell swoop because that requires a different kind of reporting and a different kind of storytelling. Do we know what the origins, like how did that even be, become yeah. a thing? Um, so it used to be used um, for, I'm trying to remember, I had a research assistant go way back with it. Um, it. It really started getting used for this in the 1980s in part because white power movement activists were describing themselves this way. Um, so there was one key person called David Lane, whose nickname in the movement was Lone Wolf, um, which actually referred to his purported sexual frustration. Um, and he was a member of the order, which was a white terrorist group that assassinated people, stole millions of dollars from armored cars and Bon Marche department stores and Fred Myers and things like that. And he eventually was imprisoned um, and wrote the 14 words slogan, which is a catchphrase for white power activists still having to do with securing the future of the race. Um, so he called himself a lone wolf. He was part of cell style organizing and um, that that phrase was popularized in part by people in the movement. Um, so if for no other reason, then I personally think it is better when a movement like this that is violent and harming people and waging direct attacks on our country and or just people um, is interested in disappearing, I would like to shine a light. So, yes. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple questions um, talking about the connection between Christian, Christianity and evangelicalism and how that plays into the white power movement. Um, interested in the role of Christianity in upholding white supremacy in the US and hear your thoughts about how it's integral to the fence post analogy. Rod, do you wanna talk about the myths part first and then I'll come back to the extremist groups? The myths part being, I lost that the, part. The myth of the country's founding, this person asked um, a myth 
in the country's founding in Christianity and Christianity and how it's been, how it was the various definitions and distortions of Christianity or how Christianity was used to create the mythology of our founding? Well, I mean, you know, um, I mean, sort of one, you know, kind of obvious answer has to do with the way in which, you know, Christianity from the very beginning, as it was used um, by, you know, white settlers was as a kind of racial and a colonial project, you know, within the country to one, justify the seizure of indigenous lands uh, and genocide of, you know, Native Americans for being, you know, quote unquote heathens, you know, and then to justify the enslavement of black people in the country to, uh, you know, to turn them into cheap labor um, and also to construct them as, you know, from, you know, savage, dark continent. So, you know, there's never really been a point where Christianity wasn't used for the racial and racist projects of the U.S. state, you know, and that's to be distinguished, you know, from um, what, uh, you know, visionaries did with Christianity to um, align it with liberation and freedom, you know. Um, so we're at a moment, I think, where uh, you know, the sort of use of Christianity for the good of um, racial hierarchies, you know, for gender hierarchies, for hierarchies around sexuality, the demonization of trans folks, uh, you know, is having a new life. Yeah, I think, um... Building on that, just thinking about what's going on in the far fringe. So now I'm talking not about um, mainstream evangelicalism um, in full, but within the white power movement. So, um, so evangelical congregations began to grow um, and become much more politicized in, in the 70s and 80s, and then really, really hit in the 90s with the culture wars moment. Um, and I think have been steadily building since then. Um, the white power movement grew at sort of the same shape and across the same years, and in some cases was able to co-opt people out of evangelical congregations and into its fold. Um, one way it did that was through a faith called uh, Christian identity, which is a political theology that claims that only white people are human and everyone else is descended from beasts or from Satan, um, depending on which doctrine you follow. Um, Christian identity also says that there is no rapture, um, unlike evangelical congregations. So all of these uh, churches have some kind of belief in the apocalypse at play. Um, the near-term apocalypse, and I will return to that in a second, but Christian identity congregations believed that there would be no sort of peaceful um, transportation of believers to heaven before this horrible tribulations and the end times battle. Um, they thought their job was to clear the world of enemies, which again is all non-white people, before Christ could return. So the white power movement took that evangelical momentum and the idea of the apocalypse and sort of used it to create this hyper-fueled sense of preparing for race war. So we see Christian identity believers in the 80s and 90s um, doing a lot of survivalism stuff, um, learning nuclear medicine, training in field medicine, getting their family ready, all of this sort of thing, and also literally preparing for battle, going to paramilitary camps, amassing arms, um, trying to get military grade weapons, etc. Um, I think that, so my study of those groups goes only through 1995, um, and I don't have a sense of how big Christian identity is in the present day movement, um, although I still see it referenced with some regularity. Um, but I think that the other component here is the sort of the way that for many people, not just evangelicals and certainly not just white power activists either, but for many people, the idea of the, the incoming apocalyptic event is 
very front of mind, um, in part because of climate change, in part because of the way our culture works, in part because of sort of the political moment. Um, and I think that that drives some radicalization and movement into these groups. So for instance, you see people talking about um, the, the nearness of the end times as sort of a reason that they um, don't need to look after their fellow man and they instead need to just hang in there and very soon they'll be transported out. Um, those sorts of ideologies are very sort of like, um, anti-collectivist in ways that can drive people to political polarization. So I think that those, those are big amorphous currents that I think are at play in both the kind of broader American culture and in white power activism today. You know, I think it's also, I think that's great and uh, super helpful. I think it's also important for us to say that you could be secular and still invest in white supremacist ideology. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. Mike, I mean, you know, um, I mean, if we think about the previous question about the relationship between, you know, white vigilante violence and uh, investments in white supremacist notions around not in my neighborhood, you know, yeah. um, you could imagine, especially the not in my neighborhood person being secular, you know, um, and so, uh, yes, Christianity has been a powerful vehicle or mobilizing Christianity has been a powerful vehicle for um, white supremacist logics, but it's not the only one. And some of them have been secular. Absolutely. Uh, another question from the chat. Um, what is the significance, if any, for the government, for the US government to name white nationalists as a terrorist group? Yeah. Um, Thank you. I, so I think that, um, okay, so one of the things to, to just put on the table is that I, I think when we think about the government and we think about the state, there are many, many, many levels of activity. There are many different people and groups and agencies in play. Um, this is a complicated thing um, for the DHS and FBI to name white power and militant right activism or what they would call DVE, domestic violent extremism, as the, the most intensive terroristic threat to the country. Um, I am sure that many people who are listening right now, um, especially my co-presenters, will quickly notice that um, adding additional surveillance and additional policing has not historically worked out very well for communities of color, even when the attempt um, is purportedly to target white extremism. So we can look at the long history of FBI involvement in trying to deal with trying to deal with these groups. Um, during the counterintelligence program, um, we know that although groups on the left and the right were both infiltrated and, and the FBI attempted to disrupt both, um, the overwhelming majority of money, manpower, and violence was directed toward the left, especially towards leftists of color in that period. So what we got coming out of the civil rights movement is a mostly intact clan, um, and we never saw anything like, um, you know, the, the killing of Fred Hampton or the infiltration of the Black Panthers or the intensive policing. We never saw any of that against the Klan in the 60s and 70s. Then we have a period in the 80s where these groups um, were sort of trying to deal with the problem, but frequently it is a game of telephone from field agents on the ground who seem to be pretty aware of the threat up through the ranks um, of people who often would not give resources, would not take it seriously. And then there are problems like, what do you do if the local police department is in fact um, involved with the group you're trying to prosecute? It goes on like this. Um, and because it's a national level movement, um, these politics are very different depending on where you are. But this is a problem, you know, in North Carolina and in suburban California, it's a problem in rural Idaho and in like suburban Texas. So um, it's, a, it's a big sprawling thing. And then, we get the Oklahoma City bombing as a moment when the government has decided to prosecute only individuals and not the movement as a whole. So this is like the epitome of the lone wolf kind of moment, right, where we see a big action that's not prosecuted broadly. Um, and as a result, 
as a result, people sort of have the idea that the Oklahoma City really was a lone wolf or a few radicals or a few bad apples. Um, and then moving forward, we hit 9-11, where there is a huge direction of resources away from all um, domestic and DVE activity and towards um, radical Islamist terrorism and the threats that really came into focus after 9-11. And I think I, you know, I would be the last person to say that what we need is a Patriot Act for white nationalism or white power activism, because that did not um, work out very well for us um, in terms of policing and civil rights and basic standards of humanity. Um, and we know that these policing resources usually cause problems. On the other hand, I do think that communities that are impacted by this violence have not had basic responses from our policing and justice systems. Um, and this is an, another set of issues coming forward. So all of that is a very, very long way of saying that I think that the resources and attention that come with that designation of um, these groups really being a terroristic threat have a number of important capacities to move things in the right direction and not least in the court of public opinion, right? Because there is a, a reasonable people, a re reasonable center of people who, um, who, who find that information persuasive in terms of thinking about how to prioritize this problem. Um, but I think grain of caution is, is very well called for. Yeah, thank you. So we're at time, but I wanna end us on a different note um, and I'm going to read this last question from the chat. Who are the writers, thinkers, activists that you turn to for inspiration and motivation for this sort of marriage between social justice and academia? That's a lovely question. You want to go, Kathleen? And sure. Mine is Lisa Lowe. I, I think her formulation of history of the present is amazing and um, <laughs> Just the idea that we can have a praxis that is both deeply scholarly and deeply tuned to inequality and social issues in the present has been um, incredibly eye-opening for me. Um, so she's she's my one. And Alicia Schmidt Camacho always, who um, it's a little bit cheating for me to name her because she was on the committee, but I will name her. <laughs> That's great. Well, I endorse both of those as friends and colleagues. Um, you know, I mean, there's so many people for me. Um, there's one person who I will uh, call out who's deceased, but um, you know sometimes uh, people who've been in the long st struggle for a long time and also not with us, you know we still hear their voices. Tony K. Bavara uh, had this uh, wonderful has this wonderful line that stayed with me for years, and I come back to it now in one of her essays called language and the writer. And she says, the task of the cultural worker 10 years shy of the 21st century is how do we save the planet from the psychopaths? That's perfect. Oh, wow. So I wanna thank you two both for uh, a great conversation, um, all the enlightenment. Thank everybody who came and we hope everybody will purchase the book when it's available. You can pre-order at Seminary Co-op um, and we hope you'll come to some more of our author events um, sponsored by Seminary Co-op, Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture, the History Department at UChicago. Thank you all and good night. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.